joined the display, a tale of four generations. And the speakers are Peter Stuge and Felix Niklas. And give a big applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Um, I'm Felix, and this is Peter. Um, hi. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we're going to tell you four tales about the display. Um, the beginning of the display was that, we, that one of our club members bought it on eBay, and um, we didn't really know what it was used for before. It was done by a metal works company um, who had an electric department that built the electrics for this and the metal shop. Um, they built the hardware around it, uh, the nice frame. And they sold it off, I think, because it didn't work out for them. Okay. So um, we got it on eBay. And it was, at, in the beginning, very, very slow. Um, at first, I wanted to show the outline. This is how it looks inside of um, our club. It's mounted on the wall. So we're going to talk about the hardware, about the first until the fourth current generation. We're going to talk about some software um, work that went into it, font and dithering. Um, then about the APIs that we have, the UDP and WebSockets, and then some fun applications that we uh, ran on it. Peter, you want to start with the All right. hardware? So hardware. Yeah, first generation. Uh, by, by, was delivered with a 6502 somehow controller board. Um, I wasn't um, I wasn't there when that was being used, but uh, some people managed to get it working and send some um, some serial protocol commands to the controller, and uh, were able to watch the characters be drawn on the display. It was was as Felix said, really really slow. So this is made up of a whole bunch of these LED uh, matrix or LED modules, eight by eight little LEDs. No slides? Ah, there we go. Wait. Thank you. So let's get back. This is the controller. This is the controller, right, the 6502. Mm -hmm. And these are the, the 8x8 LED modules that are uh, on this display. And in total, there are 20, 20 rows going down and 56, um, 56 columns. So that of, of these LED modules, 8x8, in total, that's 1,120 LED modules. And with 8x8, that gets us 71,000 and some LEDs. So it's a 71K display. So that was the first generation. And, and we got to know the hardware a bit. And uh, some, some people in the Berlin uh, CCC, they made a, uh, a new controller for this, because the 6502 wasn't, wasn't a lot of fun and was, was, as we said, quite slow. And of course, it wasn't on the network, so we needed to get on the network. Second generation was an Atmel X Mega. I, I'm afraid we don't have any photos of it. No. Yeah. Um, at this time, there was also the beginning of uh, a protocol designed for sending information to the display. It uh, consists of UDP packets that have a 10-byte header containing five 16-bit words in network byte order. That's important to us. First one is the command. We'll get into those in a little bit. And then there are four parameters that may or, or may not contain some value. If they're not used, or if one parameter is not used, then the value is just zero. After these 10 bytes, there may or may not be some data uh, payload also in the UDP packet. These are the commands. Um, in the in the beginning or the the first uh, the first yeah the first commands that were implemented, I'm sure there are a few. So you see, there are some gaps. I I don't know actually what the commands there were or the numbers there were uh, anymore. But clear, obviously clear screen text sending uh, code page 437 text 
because that's a fun encoding. And um, then we had some, some brightness commands. These, um, these LED modules, the 8x8 modules, it was mentioned on the slide, behind each of them is a Maxim Max 7219 LED driver made for this kind of matrix, LED matrix display. And in this LED driver, there's, um, there's a digital register for setting the brightness. And we exposed that using some, some commands. Let's show so a demo of that. This is a demo one of the members of the club did to test just uh, changing the brightness. Since we can only do 8x8 eight eight, uh, brightness changes, he still found a way to, to do a nice uh, application of that because for movies, obviously, it doesn't really work to do grayscale or like color tones on 8x8 pixels. But um, in the end, he used 8x8 uh, graphics to do this nice depth map. Yeah, so this, to, to explain what we're seeing here, here the whole display is filled with plus signs. So every one of these 8x8 modules is showing a plus sign. And the only thing that is changing is the brightness value or the light intensity of these modules. And that makes for a nice, even lower resolution, low resolution effect on the low resolution display. Let's go back. Going back to commands, yeah. All right, so that was character brightness, setting it on individual modules, and brightness for the full screen. In one command, just a reset command, because that, that helps sometimes. Then we had a fade experiment where uh, a graphics kernel runs over the display and sort of reduces intensity, uh, which looks like a fade. It didn't get used very much. And the main most command, the, the, the most important thing, yeah, the most important new feature in, the, um, in, in our development was to support bitmap transfer so that uh, this, this display could also show arbitrary graphics. And the very first command, because it's easier, uh, received the bitmap data in a way that fits how the hardware was built. And that's not really so intuitive or so convenient for software developers, it turns out. Um, is that here or is it, yeah, pixel data in a vertical layout. So the, the, the bitmap data was sent with each byte being eight pixels high or, or tall instead of uh, eight pixels across, which is what we usually deal with in, in software. So. Still, we could do bitmap. Uh, we could display bitmaps. That was a lot of fun and and a good start. Right, and then uh, we, we uh, of course we want to go fast, right? So we we found out actually the the hardware the factory hardware is 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 the construction is quite quite limited or quite slow. Uh, because not only because the 6502 is a relatively slow machine, but also because of how the whole data transfer was um, implemented in, in this display. So as the arrow shows here, the 6502 processor would address every single one of these 1,120 LED modules at a time and in sequence, meaning that the well, the other 1,119 LED modules were just not doing anything most of the time, right? There's only one, uh, one module receiving data. So this was changed in generation, hardware generation 2.5, where the, so actually we weren't using the 6502 controller then anymore, but, but anyway, it's just representative here. The, the main, um, the main controller, the master controller, sends data to these new row controllers that uh, were designed in, in CCCB by some members. And they have a distributed uh, video memory. So each row has, the, has a video memory for the contents that is there. And also parallelization. The master controller sends data to all the row controllers. and. Um, only to the row controllers, and the row controllers then take care of sending data out into the LED modules or the LED driver chips. This is what it looks like. I have two pictures. 
there's a bug in the hardware that we fixed. Yeah. But um, that, was, that was good. That got us um, some more frame rate in, in the bitmap, uh, bitmap transfer. And then we, uh, well, then that wasn't enough. It was still too slow for us. So we then made an experiment with uh, a microcontroller that is a bit more powerful, well, a fair bit more powerful than the Xmega. Um, a Cortex M3 ARM microcontroller, I believe 96 megahertz. And the thing about these uh, particular ones is that they had um, Ethernet Mac and Phi built into the Cortex M3 microcontroller, which was quite unusual, but uh, very suitable for for our project. So we, we still had the main problem that uh, the graphics, the bitmaps would have to be in this weird order, going up and down instead of how we're used to it from left to right. So um. yeah. So this was this is within one one row. You would have to send these vertical uh, these, uh, vertical bytes and. That wasn't wasn't that all fun, and we we decided to solve that in in generation three. We implemented a few new commands, two two new bitmap transfer commands, um, to support just the, the the regular linear bitmap transfer that um, that is used also in in the in a regular PC or, or computer. Uh, to to represent bitmap data, where you send the pixels after each other uh, uh, horizontally, and and then you move to the next sc scan line, and and so on. So there's we had more processing power, and we use that power to make it easier for developers. And also, the this ARM architecture had some nice um, instructions uh, to to do this bit. This bit transformation, like to rotate eight by eight bits, was was um, was fun and, and easy. And this, um, the 2.5G uh, new row controllers, they also they jumping back a bit. They made some optimizations as well to sort of reduce the the data transfer that needed to go into the rows because we had some flickering and we didn't have completely stable data transfer. But uh, reducing the the, uh, the throughput helped with that. That um, allowed us to uh, to to still update a lot of uh, changing information. But areas that were all the same, they didn't get updated at all. And to save power, also, if uh, one of these eight by eight modules were uh, had no LEDs on. Then this particular Maxim chip would be uh, set to power save mode. So, one also wanted to uh, improve efficiency and and reduce power consumption. When we started out with the Gen 1 hardware, we we th somehow we have some measurements. Um, we believe that we measured it to be over one kilowatt with all LEDs on, and uh, we've improved that with each hardware generation and we'll we'll come back to power in a little bit but it wasn't perfect yet we, there was something with the internet i remember yeah so uh, this this bitmap linear uh, command and the linear windowed uh, command where you can only update you cannot choose to update only a portion of the of the screen we uh, we had the issues with this um, Cortex M3 that it, it did have a built-in Ethernet Mac and Phi, uh, so network connectivity was easy, and there was an example code for an IP stack, and, and all was good. But um, unfortunately, the hardware only had two kilobytes of packet buffer memory. So if we if we take these uh, 71,000 pixels and we want to, or, or bits, and we want to send those in one packet, we have a bit of a problem because that's some nine kilobytes of data. And with this microcontroller only having two kilobytes of packet buffer, um, some packets are going to get lost. So that was a bad scene, and we, we we worked around it by instead of then sending one big UDP packet with uh, the full image data, we would manually 
do what the IP stack does. So the, we send one UDP packet with nine kilobytes of data. The, the network stack divides this up because the network can't transfer that big packets, and it splits that up into six or seven packets of 1,500 bytes or whatever the MTU is, sends that out to the display, but the display only receives the first and the third and the fifth because in between it's busy copying the, the packet that it just received into the, uh, into the display memory. Um, so what we did as a workaround in the first, uh, well, to, to overcome this uh, at first was we did this uh, splitting the video frame or the, the uh, I revealed the secret now, splitting the, the image frame um, into several packets already on the sending side, not, not in the IP stack or the network stack, but actually in the application. So we made a video or image transfer application, and uh, there we cut up the, the, the image in little packets, and we built in a, an artificial delay between the packets. And that really, that really hurt. We, that was painful. We didn't like that at all. Uh, not a nice... Because you have to understand, the goal always was to get more FPS. <laughs> Of course, we need to. We want to make it go fast, and we want to. We want to play. Want to be able to play video on the thing. That was that was always the the goal. The f second generation had um, a few FPS, like two or three or so, with the bitmap transfer commands. And with the third generation, we we were able to get it up to some nine, ten, maybe twelve FPS on a good day. Uh, but we weren't happy because that didn't look so nice still. So then we, uh, we took out the sledgehammer and uh, we decided uh, we'd try to use a BeagleBone Black because it has the PRU, uh, which is the programmable real-time unit. So the BeagleBone Black, many people know, as a Linux, Linux board similar to another fruity board that I won't mention. And um, it is a Linux board. It's a, it's a nice, uh, roughly gigahertz uh, system on a chip. But inside of this, there are also two coprocessor cores, so two 200 megahertz um, little coprocessors that are completely separate from the ARM running the Linux system. And you can write little program snippets for these, and they run, um, they run quite fast, 200 megahertz. And they can do I.O. single cycle, I.O. Uh, GPIO, well, writing and, and reading. And um, that, we figured, would be a very good way to, to increase the performance, the, the last bit that we needed. And um, so we had already we'd taken several steps. We'd already optimized the data transfer going over this, uh, the, the, the ribbon cable that you can maybe see through the, uh, through the front of the display. It used to be serial with the very first hardware. With uh, the second generation hardware, it was still serial. With the 2.5, we changed it to parallel, so one byte would be transferred at a time instead of just one bit. And the, the row controllers would then take care of sending that, uh, that data out serially one bit at a time because they have time while the other row controllers get their new data. And with the bigger bomb back, we continued that, so we write some PRU um, firmware to, to talk to the row controllers and send them out the data. Uh, the, big, uh, the, the, the PRU has a shared memory, so the Linux system just receives uh, bitmap packets or really command packets, looks at the command and does whatever is necessary and saves the bitmap data into this shared memory, does nothing else, does only that in a loop. The PRU is running independently a firmware that takes the bitmap data out of the shared memory and sends it out the bus to the row controllers. So even, even more parallelization. And uh, with this, we were able to go all the way up to 40 FPS. So that's, um, I, yeah, mission accomplished somehow. <laughs> Let's show some pictures of the insights. Right, so this is the, the, the current state of, of things. Um, we have the BeagleBone Black up top left with um, a cape on, a, bre on a, a breadboard with, I think there's some level shifters and maybe some IO buffers. I don't remember anymore exactly what's all on there. Um, but, but yeah, to, to drive the, 
drive the bus going down. And you can also see the power supply uh, here. This is uh, quite a small power supply. It's not enough for the whole, for the whole display. It's only powering the BeagleBone Black. And this is part of the, the other, uh, well, the, the real power supply, let's say, for the LEDs. Is there one more? There's actually there's two of those. Yeah, there are two, exactly. Sides, but we didn't catch that on the Right, picture. the two of these power supplies uh, are needed to, to drive all of the LEDs. I think they are, uh, I don't remember anymore, I think they're 500 watts each. But we don't, we don't actually need that much. And uh, we have two because there wasn't a single one that was high capacity enough and fanless. But they've been in the hardware since the beginning. We didn't do this, right? We did this. We mounted these power supplies. There were other power supplies before that were really inefficient. Okay. So switch, switch mode power supplies from the 1990s uh, were replaced with some, some modern, uh, modern switch mode. And who did, that mode. Nice, who did that nice wiring? Oh, we did that in, in CCCV, yeah. OK. <laughs> yeah, nice. the, the, the red and black, and the, but these Copper, copper bars and the fuses, they were already there. So they, they are a factory. And this little board in the, in the uh, center there is a, an AD converter to monitor the, the voltage uh, output of these, these power supplies because we wanted to see, OK, w when we switch on and off all of the 70,000 LEDs at a time, do the power supplies actually keep up with that? And, and yes, indeed, they do. The, it's a stable 5 volt. Yeah. This is the bottom right corner where there's the power connection and the um, Ethernet connector. And there's a nice um, engraving showing our logo. Yeah, we had to, had to tag it. <laughs> OK, so uh, let's go over to software. Um, like, as you might already feel, I, I don't know that much about the hardware. Uh, but it was always a pleasure um, being in the CCC and getting, like, hearing about all, seeing all that's being done by the different members um, of the club. Everybody's just pouring their heart out with where, what they were good in. And uh, I do web development, so I only was able to do stuff after they delivered a web server on it and <laughs> gave me WebSocket, uh, which we will be talking about soon. Uh, first, let's quickly talk about the font. So the font system is a CP437. I I'm too young to really know this, I think, <laughs> I have this feeling. Um, but I, you might also know this from the boot screen, because that's the same system being used there. Um, and MS-DOS. And MS-DOS. MS-DOS used this, I yeah. know that. <laughs> yeah. um, so there's fonts out there, obviously. Why would we need our own? Because we have our own. One member built one. Um, the problem is, we have 8x8 eight eight, um, pixel uh, modules, right? And there's 8x8 eight eight fonts. That's one of the standards. There's two different types. One is higher. It's 8x16 or something. That obviously wouldn't fit, but 8x8 eight eight would fit perfectly. But there's a problem. Our modules are one next to each other. And when you put text on there, there's no space in between. So that's, that was the need that we needed to solve, uh, that we have to have a gap. So in the end, um, a 7x7 seven seven pixel version of this very basic font was created. And this is the bitmap of it. Um, this is the basic texture set that's in there right now. And the, I don't know if you see it on the screen, but there's a light gray um, area on the right of the 7x7 of the seven seven areas. This is the gap next to it. And um, Marco, who was working on this, he, he created the font, I think, in Windows. Um, MS Paint? MS Paint, he, he said, said yeah. like in, yeah. a, in a virtual machine, now in, in Wine, I think, because oh, right, he yeah. said, this is still the best thing if you want a pixel. GIMP is not good enough for that. <laughs> and then he created some scripts around to, to export it and to, on the one hand, create a C header yep. that is being used um, on the BeagleBone. And he also outputted a, a web font that we were able to then use in the web editor, um, the web interface of the uh, display to see almost the same um, directly on your browser. And then the next big um, thinking was put into dithering. 
Um, I don't know if you know the concept, but I mean, let's say we have an image frame and it's color. Obviously, we don't have color in there. So we need to make it into something. Oh, I stepped one point too far. Uh, we need to first convert it to black and white. But then again, uh, I told you before about the brightness. We can only change the brightness in the 8 by 8 area. So we couldn't do like uh, gray, in, uh, gray in there, right? We can only do green or black or nothing. So you need dithering, which is a technique to um, create that effect um, by just using space, by just uh, using less white, uh, or in this case, green dots. It's the same technique, almost the same that printers are using, because they also only can print black and not black. So let's zoom in a bit to see, maybe see this a bit more. This is like a digital image. And um, Marco put a lot of love in this. He even built like his own Love 2D, uh, like a Lua application to test a lot of different dithering algorithms. There's Floyd Steinberg, which is a very basic one. Um, but he quickly saw that this is not good enough. <laughs> it's not f fitting the, the high quality standard that <laughs> he was aiming for. And so this was the application he built, where in the top left corner is the, the original image. It's actually in color, and there were different ones uh, for testing. And then he could compare two different uh, dithering algorithms um, in the middle and bottom picture. And in the end, he settled for, I don't have the name here, it's starting with O, and I think it's a Russian name, O something something. <laughs> Uh, as a base algorithm. Um, and then he added also some more pre-processing um, to, uh, to improve the results further. He does some blurring in the beginning, because in the end, uh, you won't see all the details with the dithering. So he blurs out, like the blurring will remove the, the details that won't be shown anyway. And then he does some sharpening afterwards to um, make those features that are going to be shown a bit sharper. Um, and you see it in the bottom left. It's not a really good representation because it's scaled. And when you scale dithered stuff, then it's bad. But you see the results on the screen itself. <laughs> um, packages or? Um, ah, packages. UDP packets, yeah. So 9 kilobyte bitmap frames. Maybe I said this already. Let's yeah. see what's the next. I mean, yeah, the UDP. About, we have to speed up a bit as well, so maybe. Yeah, that's uh, the UDP most packets. Thing yeah. was web sockets from my point <laughs> of view, <laughs> because I never touched UDP before. And um, with web sockets, I was suddenly able to send pixels to this display in the browser uh, using JavaScript. Um, the WebSocket API is not the full API. It's not the same as the UDP um, right. API. It's just for sending pixels. So I was mostly working with it uh, having a canvas and then just sending the canvas data, the, the pure pixel data, directly to the, um, to the display. Uh, there's a simple um, demo application showing the WebSocket um, implementation or how, how to send stuff there. I don't know if it's big enough to see, but in the end, WebSockets um, is, I mean, it's a two-way uh, communication based on TCP, actually, um, for the web to, to send stuff somewhere. Um, and you just build up the connection, um, say that you're going to send array buffer data, and you grab the pixels from the canvas. At first, I did that before. I drew a rectangle on the canvas in this case and then go through all the pixels, pack it up to bytes, and just send it out. And it was actually then quite simple to build applications with that. It's a very simple, very simple protocol, yeah. but it worked, worked fine. So let's talk about applications um, in the CCC uh, B, what we, what we did with it. So the basic one uh, is a welcome screen. It's, since it's mounted on the wall, usually whenever we have open days, it's on, and this is what it's showing. Um, oh, it's not always on, obviously, but 
usually this is also the boot screen. <laughs> the, one of the first, uh, one of the early, uh, the early implementations was when we didn't have the bitmap yet, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Then uh, we, the first movie was an ASCII Star Wars movie. There's apparently something where you can tail in it in and it just sends you <laughs> um, this data. <laughs> it was nice for a beginning. Um, but then, obviously, which you already see live, um, video. Um, Mark built a nice cheese streamer plugin so that you ca that, that takes care of all that dithering, um, all the pre-processing we were talking about for you. So you could just send your movie that way and it would correctly send it to the server. There's one small thing we didn't talk about in between. Um, at one point, we optimized also the, the data load by compressing it as well, right? That's true, yes. I don't know if it was between third or fourth generation. That was, uh, that was added into Gen 4, into the fourth generation. Uh, so these bitmap commands, they, they, well, one of them particularly only uses two of the parameters, two of the four parameters in the UDP protocol. And then we introduced um, some sub-commands supporting different compression algorithms there. Uh, Dennis was, was uh, busy quite, quite some time working through all the different uh, compression algorithms that he could, could find and settled in the end on set standard for, um, for, for decompression speed in particular, but still a reasonable compression rate. And also something you might uh, think about is the, the lines in between. Also, one of the steps that of the G-Stream plugin is to cut out some pixels so that it doesn't look stretched um, in the end. So the way, the way that works, the G-Streamer plugin says to G-Streamer, please deliver grayscale images to me that are actually, that have more pixels than fit on the display. And in these bitmap transfer commands, then the, the, the gaps where the, the metal is are, are copied over. So it's, it's a little bit of, it's unfortunately not zero copy, but it's um, not enough data to be a problem. And it looks a lot better than, than just um, asking for the exact pixel resolution of the display. Mm -hmm. Then the, the image is, is compressed together and not, not really recognizable. And then, when you connect to the API uh, to the IP of the um, of the display, you would see this web interface. Um, just had a basic text mode where you can, or it has a basic text mode where you can just type stuff on the screen. And there's a small canvas drawing application in there as well to do some drawing on screen. Then one of the fun things um, was also a Bitcoin info screen somewhere in between. <laughs> with live updates, um, a Tixel flight schedule. I like um, this one a lot. And there was also one for the, is that one up next? For the, yeah, it's the next one. Yeah. Yes, this one is, is really good. So on the open, open night, uh, there's the Friedestrasse station right nearby the club. And uh, towards the end of the evening, because it's weekday, the trains stop running at some time. And uh, it's very nice to have this like uh, sort of countdown when you have to leave to catch the last train. Nice catch of time, I just realized. <laughs> two, three, ah, four, yeah, two. Not bad, not bad. <laughs> and um, also a really fun project was a multiplayer tank game where you would use your phone or your laptop. Uh, you would connect to the IP um, where you would get a controller in your browser. And on the phone, you could, for example, also use your touch uh, movements to, to steer your tank and then shoot each other <laughs> um, in this multiplayer game. And the display was the, the map. And then last up, um, there was a nice demo application for the iPhone where you would just stream the camera to the display. And all right, so that's credits. It. Thanks to everybody who helped uh, helped work on this project. Everybody who did work on the project. It wasn't just me and, and Felix, but a whole bunch of people at at CCCB. And I I always had a lot of fun working uh, together on this, this thing. And I, um, 
I sort of missed that a little bit. It's been a while since since somebody Build did something it, right? with it, yeah. right? And um, yeah, mm -hmm. let's hope that that changes. I gotta say, I don't miss it because um, it's always so dangerous when they are handling it with 150 kilos in the club. <laughs> it's really, really weird. So, thanks to you too for now. Do we have questions? Sehe ich ein weißes Licht? Dann bitte mal ins Internet. Hi. Um, you mentioned that the modules uh, can be dimmed. That's where you did your first animation with. Uh, does the um, dithering algorithm also use the dimming of a module, or is it just let on or off? Um, the the dithering, as far as I know, and I, uh, the dithering doesn't use the the intensity, light intensity, because that's only possible to be controlled in eight by eight. And I mean, you you could. I I think it was actually attempted, but it didn't really look great because um, the pixels are well, much smaller than the area that you can control the intensity of, and it, it didn't look so nice. So You would also have to send several packages, like one for the dimming, one for the pixels again. Right, two different commands. I mean, we could have added a command that, that to, do, to do both, but it, it didn't, didn't look so great. Uh, yeah. Okay, we have another question here in the front, please. Thanks for your talk. Maybe you have other ideas of upgrading other uh, old nice devices. Can you share? Other ideas of upgrading old devices? Well, what, but do you have a device? I mean, uh, the screen is, uh, so you upgraded it, it's now much better than the original one. Yes. And maybe you have ideas for more projects. Um, if we have some future projects, you mean right, right. something like this? Yeah, okay. At the moment, no, unfortunately. I mean, we, there's uh, um, so there's been some work on on other display technology, um, some flip dot projects we've done, but um, not so much in the club. Not as a club project. More more that the same people who worked on this also did some some flip dot hacking, but yeah, not at the moment. If you have suggestions, okay. please just send a mail or yeah, do you it yourself. You could go on eBay, buy something, send it our way. <laughs> but, but don't send us your waste, right? Don't send us old waste and we're not going to do this. <laughs> or do we? No, we don't. No. We have one more question in the back and that's the last question, please. Or no more question. No question? You're just standing there. Perfect. <laughs> can happen. Okay, then thank you so much um, and give a big applause to our speakers, Peter and Felix. Thank you. Thanks a lot for having us.